Welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, let's see. How does this normally start? I've normally got Dave here. So uh, let's see. He says, what's up and welcome to another MoGraph MoCast. I'm Matt. And I'm not Dave. You are? EJ. And this is Dat. So uh, thanks, y'all. Thanks, everyone, for coming out. I'm super excited to have everyone here. Um, and we've got this amazing panel full of absolutely wonderful artists. De uh, Nick, is there any way we could turn this one up? Oh, let's turn off the music. It's like it's like creating a vibe. You don't like right? the vibes? Like you like to say, you know? <laughs> Patrick taught me the, the term vibe, you know? Getting into that, those, uh... Do you know that vibe <laughs> is short for vibrations? Yeah. <laughs> good vibrations is really about good vibes. Good vibrations, yeah. Um, can y'all hear everything okay? And everything being recorded all right? Just making sure? All right, cool. All right, we've got this amazing panel here. Um, a really talented artist. I don't know everyone's name. Um, I only met some of them shortly, so I'm really excited to have everyone introduce themselves. Um, let's start with you, Matthias, over on your side. <laughs> All right, hi everybody. Um, Matthias, aka Major VFX, have been building community over at Maxon for the last 14 years. Um, a lot of these people are long-term friends I've known for over a decade. I also do uh, motion graphics work myself and uh, published author, uh, uh, actually international best-selling author of the five most important things you don't learn in school. So, uh, yeah, that's me. If you buy his book and then you also buy the five things you'll learn in school, you'll know everything. My maps, you learn the five things. Come on, Brilly, it's you. We're going down the row, like in in elementary school. I'm skipping EJ. Uh, <laughs> no, EJ, EJ. I'm host. Yeah, yeah, he's a host. I am host. Oh, he is. Yeah. The host. Okay. Right, so we just assume people know who he is since he's the host. <laughs> All right, what's up, everybody? I'm David Brodor, a.k.a. Brilli, uh, digital artist, been doing this for quite some time. Uh, I'm also a professor, been doing that for a lot longer than I ever set out to do it. And, uh, you know, I just try to juggle a bunch of things all at the same time and um, see where it goes. But uh, digital art for a while, uh, born and raised in, in Delco, so I'm a, I'm a Philly local here, and uh, I live in Florida now. Uh, but uh, it's, it's great to be back, and uh, there's no place like Philly, so... Hi, everybody. I'm Chris Schmidt from Rocket Lasso. I just did that third presentation. Uh, uh, Rocket Lasso does plugins and tools and live streams, and we've been doing stuff in Cinema 4D for a really long time. How are we doing? My name is Patrick Foley, or Patrick 4D. Uh, I actually just presented as well. I don't know if any of you saw it, <clears throat> but we did... Uh, I am a 3D artist based in Atlanta, Georgia, formerly a director of photography, and uh, been a freelancer in the 3D world for about six years, five years maybe. So yeah, doing a lot of food stuff now. He's the one who convinced half of you to go get Philly cheesesteaks, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm Joel Dubin. I'm partner, uh, creative director at Mad Microbe Studios. Uh, we're a studio based here in Philly. We focus on medical animation for pharmaceutical clients, uh, creative agencies, um, I've been using Cinema 4D since 6.5, I believe. It's been a while, so um, and I haven't learned half of the stuff that's been added to it in the past few versions. So it's, this is really a, it just a good, keeps growing. It just keeps a, growing. Yeah. So uh, this is a good good thing for me to be at. So uh, pass it on to Gary, my colleague. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm a certified medical illustrator. My name's Gary Welch. Um, I've been uh, doing medical illustration, 3D animation, interactive for over 30 years, um, and uh, work with Joel. Joel and I go way back. Um, I'm just happy to be here. Welcome to Philly. Hi, uh, I'm Maria Guyonten, and I'm a 3D artist. Um, I'm a master of fine arts in computer graphics, 
and I have freelanced for the past six years for my own company. Um, I'm a jack of all trades, master of them all. <laughs> um, yeah. Really hard to follow. <laughs> I'm going to lean in and hope I don't sound too asmr to you guys. I am Kieran Robinson. I am a little motion guy, little design guy at a studio called Scholar. Um, I do fine arts on the side, and if you're not seeing me design, I'm probably taking care of my plants. Another pug daddy. Pugs? Did you say pugs? Plants. Oh my god. I want oh, pugs. Plants. Can I have oh, some plants. Not a sorry. I thought you said uh, that was we just like became yeah. best friends. Have to love some of your pugs if you want to give me some of your pugs. For sure. Hi, I'm Mike. Uh, I'm a freelance motion director, designer. Uh, I worked for about 10 years in Brooklyn, and now I live in, well, I lived in Old City for a number of years, and now I live in South Jersey. Uh, so I'm love to network with you guys, and thanks for having me. Awesome. So that, uh, that brings up, actually what you just said, brings up an interesting thing. While we're all, why we are all here, uh, me and Gabe were actually talking about this earlier, how um, I, I, I feel like uh, with COVID, you know, um, it put us all inside, we're all inside, and we kind of lost that sense of community for a really long time, you know? And uh, it's really exciting to get out and be able to see people again and talk to people and like connect because I feel like us as artists are like, we, we need that, we need that interaction, you know, in order to keep us sane. I'd love to hear everyone else's thoughts on that. Um, yeah. Oh, for sure. Um, so for me personally, you know, I went to school during the pandemic right so i got to see that transition from oh i get people's face right in front of me i get to talk to people i get to see them work right to everyone's a little digital screen and you're connecting friends and it's it's a little bit rough i guess in the sense that you know you don't get that personal interaction but in that digital space as well it gives you a little bit more time for a little bit more robust interaction in a sense like you can't you can't explain a meme to a person, you know, and it's always awkward doing that little song and dance where you pull up your phone and then show them, and and your webcam doesn't like focus. Or exactly, you have that. to do the um influencer yeah. the, right. the the makeup <laughs> influencer thing, right? Um, but having a digital space, right, it gives you so much more opportunity to do things while you're working, have amenities that you don't have while you're at the job, right? You have to connect with people while you're working as well, but you can do that. It's just extra steps, <laughs> a few extra steps. Yeah. Uh, Joel, as a, uh, as a studio owner, how, how did it affect you? Did you have to run uh, totally remote? And uh, are you guys, it, it, was that influential in like maybe staying remote or something like that? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, we we founded Mad Microbe as a fully remote studio right from the beginning in 2015. It was very easy to to transition into that sort of way of working. Um, you can use Dropbox to upload and share files. Uh, there's there's a whole lot of different software uh, platforms to communicate with throughout the day. Some some work, some don't. But um, but. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's worked for us. It's allowed us to hire people anywhere in the world, anywhere in the country. Um, and we just actually during COVID, you know, we were already set up for that. So it, and we've just, we've kept working that way. Um, and I, I agree. I'm sorry. I, what was your name again? Kieran. Kieran. Yeah. I, I sort of, I, I hear what you're saying. And, um, and I hear what you're saying too, as, as far as needing to have that one-on-one uh, -on -one personal interaction with other artists. And I think that is important, but um, we do try to make it, uh, we, tr in, in, we try to integrate that communication digitally at Mad Microbe, where we've got sort of rooms where people sort of can just, you know, throw up, you know, funny memes and GIFs. And, and there's, there's a constant interaction with, with the team, no matter where they are in the world. Um, and I feel like, you know, we all do try to get together every now and then, but... Um, it's it still works somehow. It's like I feel I, I feel close with everybody on the team. I don't feel like there's a there's a distance. I feel like I know everybody pretty well. We're you know face to face on screen several times during the day. 
we're always sharing screens. We're always, uh, you know, we, we, we team up artists to work together to solve problems and they'll share each other's screens. And, you know, if they're having a problem with, uh, did you find, uh, that already being set up as a remote studio, uh, before the pandemic that it actually helped you succeed more than some other studios would? I think so. I mean, I think it, it did help us because it didn't it didn't impact us in that way because we were already sort of set up and we were actually trying to work with a lot of the agencies and clients that we work work with and they were sort of fumbling around trying to 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 figure that out. So yeah, I guess it was just luck that we sort of decided to work that way. And and you know, sometimes I think it would be nice to be in a in a studio uh, and working with other people face to face, which I've done in other lifetimes, but. Um, I don't know. It just it just it's working, and I uh, we're not planning on changing it. Broke, don't yeah. fix it, right? Exactly. There's one thing I was going to add to this because I thought it was really interesting. I really loved actually moving a lot of the attention online because it was already there anyway, and it just kind of forced more interaction on a global network of artists. Like when we started doing um, the 3D motion show instead of the 3D motion tour. I found that I was connecting with people from Istanbul and Brazil and the Caribbean, places that I didn't necessarily have direct connections with that would tune in on a regular basis that I'd started broadening my horizons on who was really in the community, as well as who should we go visit? Like who, who should be, you know, uh, a group that we connect with. And that's something that I found was quite different than going into the office and having the same conversation with my tech team again and again, the same conversation with, with those people. I found that there were people all over the world that were willing to engage. And, you know, I, I find that the hybrid model, it, it sh- I almost feel that it should be still focused very remote because that's where like all the customers aren't just the same people you're talking to every day. There's, there's more people out there than you know are interested in connecting with you if, if you can get out there. Yeah. Um, actually, uh, Patrick, I'm going to throw this to you because... <laughs> Because you've got you've got a Discord, you know, uh, uh, and I I found your Discord and I really enjoy your Discord, you know, and I have found that that's a place that you know digitally where I look forward to going to every day and stuff. And it's interesting because, you know, meeting face to face to me is totally different than being online. And you, as running an online community, you know, I'd love to know your thoughts about that. Yeah, well, it's it's interesting because coming from the film world, I was always used to having to do work with people on a production set. So it's like I was with, you couldn't do this kind of work unless you were with people holding all this expensive camera equipment and like doing this crazy thing and then you get the wrap and then, uh, but when I moved to this world, by the time COVID hit, I was actually already fully fledged working remote either way. So that was kind of the silver lining. And I was actually getting more work than I had ever gotten because a lot of the companies that I was working for, they started getting a lot of customers kind of trying their products because they were just sitting at home doing nothing. And so they needed content for their, their brand. So I was doing a lot of artworks and stuff of that matter. But the Discord came along probably like a year or two into COVID. Are we still in COVID? Is that a thing? No, who, uh, the world health organization just said it was over. Okay. Like a week ago. Okay, cool. So, you know, <laughs> so like a year and I had like, I'd say like a year and a half ago, I started the discord and I didn't even know what it was, but I, I guess before that I would just work on the daily and maybe FaceTime people, listen to music. And I started this thing that my buddy told me about. And I was like, I guess I can post some links to this. I don't know, like some extra content. And, before you know it, I started streaming on there every day and the streams aren't safe. They're just like where I kind of, you hop in a voice channel and like stream it and you can even activate your camera and talk to these people. And all these people started coming in. And at this point it's like, I'll hop on this, this discord and people are already doing their thing, working on projects, collaborating, even met someone who, I guess he's in the bathroom right now, but he, one of the guys, Cole, he pulled up here. Uh, we met for the first time face to face who was part of my discord. And he's in there every single day. But, you know, back to what Matthias was saying, when I log in every morning at like 9 a.m. to stream, almost everyone that I'm talking to for the first half of the day is from Europe. So it's like it's it's allowed me to talk to so many more people from different uh, parts of the world and just like figure out what the stuff and industry is like on that part. And I probably wouldn't have been without COVID in the Discord. So it is kind of like a blessing in disguise, that part of it at least. What's the community like here in Philly and how was it 
before COVID and now is it, did you guys have meetups here? Like how many people here has, this is like their first meetup in Philly. All right. Philly? So like, yeah. Almost like everyone. Yeah. yeah. Well, people that live here too. Yeah. yeah. There used to be a few, but you know, years ago, like an after effects group or a, there was a, like a light wave group or something. Yeah, that's, about about it. It. that's about it. Electric image. That's really dating ourselves. Posted a mic. Sorry. Yeah. I was just, I was just, uh, I was just saying, yeah, we, there used to be, um, a few different meetups, but we're, we're going back like 10, 15 years. There's really nothing now that I am aware of at least. And I always wondered, like, because of the proximity to New York city, like Mike, I know you, you used to live in, uh, Brooklyn and you just moved here about three years ago. Like, is there a lot of freelance work here for people that work at Philly? I know Comcast is like the big fish, uh, so I actually, I took a staff position at an agency in Philly, which brought me, brought me down from Brooklyn. Uh, and then due to COVID, you know, experienced some layoffs. So uh, I've been trying to infiltrate the Philly scene. I've been mostly working with New York because, again, I had such a rich history with New York. Um, so, again, part of my interest in meeting you all, discovering new ages or uh, studios in Philadelphia and stuff. Um, I, yeah, there. I mean, there's going to be work in New York, L.A., you know, all over the U.S. That was something I was really surprised with. It's like when COVID hit and speak up if you can agree with this. A lot of places obviously went remote and this all sorts of work just started kind of popping up. I was working with a place in Atlanta. I was working a place in L.A., Detroit. It was pretty incredible. Um, and then lately I've noticed that maybe there's, an, again, speak up if you, if you agree, uh, there's been a little bit of a trend of kind of going back towards the office, maybe a little bit of a hybrid situation. So I've noticed with my experience that I've kind of fallen back towards the New York, LA kind of uh, studios and agencies. Uh, but I'm here, Philly. I would love to work with you. Uh, let's do some stuff. I'm over just across the river. Like I, I would really love to just be contribute and join the, the, the Philly um, motion design industry. And I'll, I'll say, uh, real quick, and then we'll, um, I'll, I'll say real quick, uh, uh, you know, out, out, because of COVID, you know, a lot, a lot of us got to experience work from home and stuff like that. And it was fantastic. But I think the best thing that came from it is that I, I, I think studios are so much more willing now to work with people remotely versus like asking them to come into the studio and work for them and stuff like that because it just they understand that oh yeah that can actually work we can do this remotely i think that i was going to say i think that brings up a good point and we can maybe talk about it is like collaboration styles like how did you find collaborating differently between you know remote work and in-person work and have you found it just as uh, effective across the board for for everyone i was just gonna jump in with my yeah, perspective really quick and um so i've been in the industry a long time and it was you needed to go to a, a studio in person to use a render rack and then um the job before mad microbe i was at an interactive company with some very young people even though we were all in the office space together we really didn't interact they were all messaging each other and there's like sub clicks and everything right in the office. So there was a, like, I think if, if you haven't been in a studio space in a long time, that way of online, and, online communicating was already happening in person. It was like less personal being in person. Um, so that's just my, what I get the clicks. Yeah. I had a job recently where me and another guy kind of connected and we'd talk trash about the rest of this. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks, what was your question again? I'm sorry. It was just collaborating. So for those those of you who started working remotely or have been, have you found um, just as easy collaborating with everybody else globally? Did you feel that everybody just all of a sudden had the ability to collaborate? Or did you find that there was a desperate need to meet in person to get work done at any point? I mean, just speaking from my experience, it's 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 easier for us to sort of collaborate with people. We can just jump on a call and just share screens like I was saying. And um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there hasn't been any hindrance at all. It feels like it's completely smooth, you know, our, our interaction and ability to collaborate as a team. I don't know if somebody else feels different. Um, I actually agree. And I think as well, especially like pre, pre-pandemic to post-pandemic, I found that there's a lot of applications that are geared for collaborating 
over the internet over a long period of time or space of time that have popped up like sync sketch and like um muriel and even like frame.io in which like yeah you can point stuff out when you're getting shown a frame or an animation right but you can also like on frame.io you can annotate on on sync sketch you can annotate when something's wrong the exact frame that something's wrong with and that's their as notes, living notes for like as long as you need, right? And that helps the collaboration process because you don't have to constantly ask the same question over and over. You have that that little bank of information for as long as you need it as well. Cool. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Matthias, you had a couple other things. On your list, right? Yeah. I mean, one of the big things is, you know, the industry moves a million miles per second yeah. nowadays. So, you know, there's updates. There's probably an update while I'm having this conversation, right? There's probably new updates yeah. that are- Yeah, Adobe just bought three more companies. Yeah, there's just, you know, um, and, and that's one thing that's, I think, can be overwhelming. So I, that's something I'd love to know is with it constantly evolving and the industry evolving, how do you stay ahead as well as maintain your, you know, creative edge and don't just get lost in the technical? What, how do you balance that and how do you stay ahead? What, what are some of the places you go? Joel, you just said that you haven't updated C4D in a while or you don't know the new features. So how, like, yeah. Yeah. like how do you balance the need of like, I got to learn everything versus like, I know what I can do and updates aren't going to change that. Like, yeah, you do. I, I think I was a person who asked that question on the list too. So, <laughs> um, that's, that is a challenge. Um, and, uh, I, I, I'm wondering about that, the answer to that question myself, because, uh, working in the studio, I'm also as creative director, I, I, I get my hands dirty and I'm, I'm doing the work, but, um, half of my day is spent doing other things, you know, dealing with the business. So, um, I do, I am, I do fall behind quite a bit, you know, I, uh, and I, I actually look to my staff to sort of like educate me on the things that, I, that I'm, I'm lacking but um yeah i don't really have an answer that's a that's more of like a bigger bigger question to sort of uh maybe other people i get the not updating thing yeah you know especially when you're in bit in the middle of big projects and stuff like that you know for the longest time i worked for a studio who was on r20 and redshift gosh like three it was just you know just because they couldn't update their server farm because they were working on all these huge projects and stuff like that and yeah, you do feel like you kind of fall behind a little bit with that. But um, to jump on what Matthias was saying, you know, I think a big part of, you know, staying fresh and stuff like that is continuing with your education, you know, like uh, 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 learning these new tools like ZBrush, you know, I'm sure a lot of y'all are going to go home and try ZBrush tonight, mm -hmm. you know. And like learning the new capsules or taking a school of motion course or taking a MoGraph.com course that's 50% off right now. Oh, I got to cut that out. Dave, cut that out. <laughs> out right now, right now. Now, right now. Good thing we're not live. <laughs> yeah, I'll just jump in here. Um, one thing we try to do, and, and I maybe encourage other, other studios or other artists who work remotely to do as well, is we try to... Um, to include some time throughout the day or throughout the week for artists to collaborate and share their their findings you know like if there's a particular technique that they've they've worked out to, to create a particular effect they'll still do like a tech talk for everybody and kind of show how they've done that sort of like how you know you guys are i really like that idea i like that idea a lot so like once a week if we if we can swing it we'll try to do that we also have like dedicated groups for you know you know, how to learn this tool or how to, you know, whatever it is, uh, um, how to, how to learn, you know, like we have a ZBrush training, uh, chat that, you know, the, the guys that really know, know their ZBrush will, will post what they've done and people will ask questions and every now and then they'll jump on a call with whoever was interested. So, um, you know, just finding people, I guess that, um, that are willing to share their knowledge, uh, and, and trying to you know interact with them as much as you can and and um encouraging groups of people to sort of just just uh share their knowledge throughout the weekday whatever that's really awesome like the collaboration like tech showcase it's funny because we do that and we're you know a big company so having that because there's you know we have 
Max on five different product lines between, you know, Forger and Redshift, Red Giant, uh, Cinema, ZBrush. Like, there's a lot. So there's always something coming up. So the product manager will, will do showcases on a routine basis. And I feel like it's almost like every month I'm seeing several different, you know, new pop-ups of just trying to stay up to date. Um, I wanted wanted to talk on the creative space, and this one's specifically for Maria and Brilli, because you guys have been doing your own thing for a while. Do you find when working with clients nowadays, are they more coming to you because of a style, or do you ever feel that you're in contention and having to be like a button pusher because they have an idea and they kind of just want you to do it, or are they really coming to you and just kind of hand it over and trust you? What, what have you been experiencing more of? And is that something that has changed over time in your uh, in your career? Um, for me personally, um, I do a little bit of both. Mostly, I get hired just for my style and my artwork, um, but I have to pay the bills too. So I do a lot of like behind the scenes stuff that I don't post, and you know. Um, but those are my favorite kind of projects where I just get something that I have to create, and they give me creative freedom. And yeah, that's, that's like 90% of my projects. I do dig that you're almost always posting like work that you're working on and stuff. And it's always your own personal work because it, it makes, it makes me feel crappy that I'm not working on my own stuff all the time, you know, or at least showing it off. But it, 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 it's kind of inspiring to see people creating their own work. I think it's also because I come from like a more fine art world. So I'm um, more also more like exhibiting my work. I do exhibitions. I um, do prints, physical artwork. I work in different mediums, um, but always in this like 3D digital realm. Um, and I'm like trying to invent va- ways to sort of showcase this 3D digital art, but in a physical space and... Um, yeah, but there's like a fine line. I'm also, I also want to do these commercial projects. I do really like doing those too. So there's like a fine line of just balancing out those creative and technical projects. Yeah, and um, yeah, I mean, similar for me too. I'm, I mostly do uh, and get hired for like my own style anymore. Uh, but this was kind of like pushed and deliberate by me of like doing a lot of personal work over years and putting that out there. And then, you know, more and more clients would come and say, Hey, we really dig this, you know, and you know, just, just go for it. I turn down every single project that doesn't give me that freedom. I don't take any of them. Uh, and so I don't get burnt out. Uh, I don't have creative blogs. I get a lot of projects, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 but I, but I don't, I don't work on those projects anymore. Uh, for a while I did. It's just like whatever project comes in, I'm saying yes to, yes to, yes to. And for me, it was the opposite effect. Every time I said yes to something, I was saying no to something else. And so now I say no to all those projects that you know didn't give me that kind of creative freedom. And the ones that do end up coming in. Uh, so you just got to be kind of patient with it. Uh, and and so you know, that's again happened over, over kind of like a, a long period of time and wasn't something that like I just started out and did it now i will work at a studio and like for example like if kieran hit me up and uh, he's at scholar really really super dope studio if he hit me up um i would i would work for scholar just because it'd be cool to work with him but it would have nothing to do about the project or anything else it'd be about like the people so like i will take opportunities like that also that are, even if it's like i don't get to run the project or it's not my creative they really are, they need some roto work over there <laughs> yeah no i'm not jumping in on that one i'll hire somebody out and they won't know um yeah and so you know that's been that's been my thing because when i when i was working full-time at studios i would get burnt out because and, and we were we were talking about this um a little bit earlier i think uh in the audience here too uh with gabe uh, that at studios sometimes you lose that creativity on client projects like they start out really cool and you're like oh this is sick i can't wait to work on this and then like that cool thing gets stripped out stripped out stripped out until you're like I don't even care about this freaking project anymore. Like, I, let's just hit the the end date and we'll have a director's cut where we put all the cool stuff back in. But like, you kind of lose that motivation. So that was my thing to like, 
do personal projects because that's where I got my creativity from. So, you know, that's, that's the projects I take with clients now. How, how do you keep from getting burned out, especially as, you know, a teacher and a husband with children, three children, right? Three. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I, I would, and doing extra projects on top of that. Like, I, I get burned out just doing this tour, but like, you know, <laughs> but it comes down. I, I own my own, my time. I only do what I want. And so how, how are you going to get burned out if you're making your own choices and it's based on what you actually like to do? So yeah, I don't get burned out. I used to I do like a hundred, a hundred hour week for three weeks straight working for somebody else and then followed by an 80 hour week. And like, that was, that was my life for four years straight, just doing those kind of hours and I'm out. I think you brought up something that was really interesting is you're not getting burnt out because you're making your own decisions. So you found more burnout when you were doing it for someone else, where it was basically someone else's dream or vision and nothing for you. Oh yeah, exactly. Right. Cause like you're putting in all these hours and I'm like, I, I just exactly that. Like I did something for Fox sports and it was like my last draw of like working for someone else like that. And I, it was three weeks straight of a hundred hour weeks and flanked by two eighty something hour weeks. And, and I was like, I'm not getting any overtime. I'm not getting compensated for this. I was a full-time employee and I was like, screw that. I actually don't need these studios. I, I'm just going to go directly to the client. And that's what I, that's what I did. Sports graphics are rough. Yeah. <laughs> no offense to anyone who does sports graphics, but. <laughs> no, all, all the kudos to everybody who does. <laughs> so, so another question that, uh, you know, cause we are in kind of crazy times. And I think one of the things that we've seen the last couple of years is there's a lot of uncertainty. Are there any things that keep you up be it as a freelancer, as an artist that are, you know, worried pain points or uh, things that you're extremely excited about. So it's, you know, there's there's a lot of worries and a lot of opportunities. Where do you sit? Like, where do, where do those things sit in your mind um, as creatives, owning studios, you know, working in studios, being independent? What are, what are some of your biggest concerns that, you know, some of the audience could probably relate to? Everyone at once. <laughs> Walking into a fire. I'm sure. Can I see raise hands? Who are freelancers? All right. And who's staff? Okay. And then for for, for the staffers, are you hybrid, remote, fully remote? Hybrid. Okay. Uh, Sorry. I just want to get that understanding to see how many people are freelancers. But from a freelancer's perspective is walking in the fires. That's something I, I worry about. Uh, So I try my best to get as much information from a producer, from a scheduler. I most of the time work with studios. Um, I'm not as talented as these folks that have direct to client, which I aspire to that one day. Um, And so often I have to kind of vet, right, and see timelines turn around. Am I the only artist? Are there other artists that are going to be working with me? Do I have to report to an ECD? Am I the CD? Sometimes I'm a CD on some projects. Knowing as much ahead in, in advance can kind of help prepare you for something that could be a fire, could not be a fire. Um, so I always try to kind of make sure I can see what my role is, what my responsibility is. I have a 12 month child, you know, I want to be mindful of OT and weekends and all the things like that. So the more information, then you're better prepared for, for that project. Terrible about that, but I 100% agree with you. The number of times I have just walked into a fire because I'm excited about doing the job. It's like, Oh, a Nike job. Sweet. Let's do that. Oh no. Or, oh, Facebook job? Oh, that's going to be great. Oh, that is great. <laughs> yeah, and, and look, if it's worth it, if it's like an Apple project or, you know, you signed an NDA and you, you and, and yeah, if it's worth it. And you, I told my wife, hey, look, I might have to work late nights. I might have to work a weekend, but this is really cool. This is going to be on my portfolio. And she's like, do it. And then we do it and it's fine. Um, and also duration of the booking. And, you know, if you guys do first holes and stuff like knowing what's ahead, sometimes playing the system to your advantage, you know, like maybe using a first hole to just maybe work for two weeks, see how that project is for two weeks. And then, you know, some people have their own first hold 
Maybe you work for two weeks and then you're like, oh, the first whole release, and then I'm gonna book you for the next six weeks. That could be a way of not going into a fire. Maybe just being a part of the initial design phase and then getting into animation. Like a lot of the different tricks of the trades to avoid those fires and dodge bullets, which I've been doing for most of my career. <laughs> I, I used to always also say yes to things just because I thought I would never get a project again, but there is always another project. So. Don't be afraid to say no to the, the ones that you do not want to do. 100%. Pro to, like when you go to freelance, and I was talking with Mike about this earlier, they don't like that. It's no joke when they say have some money saved up when you go to freelance because then you're not in that scarcity mindset where you're just taking anything that's take, uh, in front of you. Because think about the time, like if a project just goes on forever and ever, it's the worst project ever. And like you, you were saying, Maria, projects are always going to come in. You're taking some crappy project that you're just stuck in the mud with and then maybe facebook knocks on your door a week later and you're like i can't because i'm on this crappy project that i took because i was desperate so don't work from a scarcity mindset especially when you're a freelancer like always you want to be the really uh method here where you can turn down things that don't fit your, your brand or you know aren't helping you out at the time but if you don't have the luxury of saying no then at least get as much information and know like if this is going to hurt how long is it going to hurt you know Contracts, scope of, Can, scope yeah, of work. Yeah, contracts, definitely. Payment of work. Yeah. If if I could just jump in here really quick too, uh, I have a cousin who's a self-employed game designer. He invented Bop It, and um, his Bop It. Yeah, you know, I've seen that guy on TikTok. Oh yeah, Bob Welch. <laughs> um, yeah, he's my cousin, and uh, I was asking him about freelance advice, and he said, you know, what he does is he makes it clear to all his clients from the start that he has other clients. So it's like when he doesn't want to take the job, he says, oh, I'm sorry, I'm busy with this other client. It's like, no, I don't, he's not saying I don't want to work with you. He's saying I'm, I'm busy with this other client if it's a job he doesn't want. And then, you know. Yeah, the hardest part is, and this happened to me recently, I was, you know, um, I hadn't had any work for a couple months and I was, I was a little hard up and for work. And I got this opportunity just from some random company who hit me up on LinkedIn and they're like, Oh yeah, it's a four month contract. I was like, sweet. That's going to be a lot of money, you know? And they're like, Oh, will you work for less than your random? I'm like, ah, it's four months. Okay. You know? And then it turns out to be part-time work, you know, once we actually get into the project. And what sucked most about that is that I had other clients coming to me who's like, hey, we need you full time. Can you do this? And I'm like, sure. So, you know, you got to juggle then two jobs without letting them know that the other ones are happening. Second work day. <laughs> second work day. <laughs> yeah, second work day. Thank you. You know? And so, you know, then it becomes you're even more in the weeds and you're more burnt out and stuff like that. You're just waiting for him to get over versus just getting your information and finding what it's all about, you know? And yeah, something I wanted to piggyback on that is, and are you guys in any other uh, spaces for financial or if I don't make art, I don't get paid or are there other things that you're doing, any side gigs or anything else that you find yourself drawn to that still either, um, you know, capitalize on your creativity, but then are also financially, you know, uh, beneficial. Weirdly enough, I actually help people meal prep. <laughs> Yeah, a pretty decent cook over here. Love chefing it up. Um, and I'd get friends that are consistently wondering, hey, what can I do to maximize the time that I can spend outside of the kitchen, but still have food that tastes fresh with the stuff that's local to me? I'd give them little recipes, work out a schedule with them, and then I'd get paid from that as well. It's kind of awesome. <laughs> that's rad. It was still, still creative, just moving it from the screen to the kitchen. Yeah, instead of a style frame that you can like see with your eyes, it's a style frame that you can eat with your mouth. It's <laughs> like it. Low graph, no meal. Low graph, no meals. So I want to share it that says a style frame you can eat with your mouth. <laughs> Anybody else doing anything else in the financial world that they're enjoying or happy with that's you know, coming up with some type of income to help supplement the creative. Um, I mean, I make money off my art, um, but when I'm really running out of money, I try to like sell merch or prints or try to like capitalize on our work that I've already made. 
Yeah, I think there's. Uh, I'm I'm seeing a lot of artists these days doing their own Patreon, like Vincent Schwenk or or, or Thanos Motion Punk, and I, I think artists can can be very smart. And like, what are the byproducts of your job? Like, did you make a cool like uh, texture pack or something that you own the rights to and you can sell uh, sell off, or any knowledge that you can make a tutorial and uh, sell off with Patreon? So I think there's a lot of creative ways that all of us as artists can 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 think about ways that we, again using byproducts or just the knowledge we have and finding the niche of like you know you're making food renders but you, did you start out by thinking you're going to do food renders like no that's just what resonated and you you leaned into it so finding that thing that you can lean into is very uh, important yeah i i jumped into real estate uh and and so it was kind of like an offshoot but you know it's one of those things which also gives me more power to control when I want to work, when I don't want to work, and what clients that I, I choose to work with or not to work with. Uh, I'm also a professor, as I had mentioned. You know, being the, a professor, though, was my way of giving back to the community. It wasn't like, like this will give me uh, options to maybe take less work or something like that. It was like I felt like I had worked with the biggest studios, the biggest brands, and it was my time to go and and teach, not feel like, okay, I'm burnt out from the industry, I wanna take a break, uh, or I'm done with it, I'll go teach now. It was like, no, like I'm fully immersed in the industry. I love what I teach just as much as the students love what they are going there to learn. Uh, and so being able to approach it with that, um, you know, kind of passion, you know, it is a side thing that I do the, uh, as a professor. Uh, it's a full-time, I'm a full-time professor. Uh, but yeah, between that and real estate, and I, I just feel like I, I, I do, I, I'm always doing something else on, on the side in addition to, uh, to motion design. Is anyone worried about the current job market? I think it's something to pay attention to for sure. You know, me with uh, graduates that just graduated, you know, a, a week ago, um, you know, I, I I look at it and I'm like, even though I'm not particularly going to be affected by it, you know, it's important to see that companies are not really hiring right now. You know, there's the companies are doing mostly layoffs. Uh, and that's not to make anyone nervous or anything like that. But I think, well, you, but it's to be honest though too, you know, because I think transparency is really important. And 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 so yes, yeah, studios are not really hiring people right now. And it's not that studios are like going broke. No one knows what the budgets are going to be over the next few months. And so the studios are not willing to take on another financial burden that that then to have to let you go after a few months. So. Um, I, I, I'm not anticipating, uh, you know, a rock bottom here, but I think we got to give it a few months to feel it out and hopefully, uh, the budgets come back and people start hiring on. But when you see big tech and all that stuff doing these kind of major layoffs, it's going to hit us kind of directly. But if you think about what happened with COVID, COVID happened and I got no jobs for like two months straight, maybe three months straight, like, Damn. and everything just froze up. Anybody that was working on something, that all those jobs froze, stopped, got canceled. And then literally after three months, I had never been so busy in my entire life. So I, I you know, I say it, 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 there's ups and downs. We're definitely in kind of this low moment, but like literally it could be followed up with like one of the busiest moments for motion designers. Joel, I'm, 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 I'd love to throw this to you. You're like, oh man. <laughs> I don't want to answer this. No, I'm I'm curious as a studio owner, uh, has has business been the same? You know, same volume and stuff. And I'm sure medical is very different, you know, industry than say advertising or tech or something like that. But I'd I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, we are we we deal with a different uh, industry, a different clientele. We're dealing with the pharmaceutical industry. It's a global industry. So on the plus side of that. You know, we we tend to not be hit as much, maybe as other, you know, areas in the in the in the motion design animation field. Um, not to say that we don't have lulls every now and then. Um, and I don't have a crystal ball. I have no idea what's going to happen. You know, with thing the way things are going right now here in the states and globally. But um, I just try not to. I'm trying not to think ahead too much and just. Uh, just focus on what we what we know now, what we have, and and just uh, you know, just and hope for the best. Um, I, I would say that you know the it, 
there's always going to be a need for medication, you know, and, and the, the companies are making, you know, they make the pharmaceutical companies make a lot of money and uh, they, they need to market their, their drugs. So it's like, it's, it's, uh, and there's always diseases to be sort of cured. Um, and that way we've sort of, you know, you know, always seem to have found, uh, work in, in all avenues of, of that, that world there. So, yeah, I w I will say, um, uh, when during the last big recession, I worked for a company It was the company that me and Dave, uh, where we met, um, it was a, a terrible, terrible advertising company and they would do local jingles that like are just so bad. And, um, but the re they made a lot of money specifically because they were targeting companies that were looking to grow through advertising. So some companies, a lot more companies are willing to throw advertising dollars in order to, you know, increase their profits, you know, in a way. So the work, while even if we do go into a recession or something, the work is still going to be out there and it may actually be more for us. It's a good point. Can I open up Pandora's box and give uh, some qu some quality advice at the same time as an economist? You gonna open AI art? Yes, sir. All right. Should we, should we open it? All right. I, I guess. Yeah, we got twenty five minutes left. Let's destroy this place. <laughs> All right. So yes, AI art. So we're, that's gonna open up the Pandora's box. So hey, that's on the table now. So let's go ahead and start. Uh, you know, pull the pin on that and uh, see how long it takes to explode. But here's one of the big things. You can take a look at where funding is going. Like that, that industry, while it's terrifying, there are companies that are starting up that have millions and millions and millions of dollars of funding. So if you just play the game of follow the money, how many of you have pitched an AI company? One. So that there's a, there's an opportunity. So we're always having to sell because yes, we have the passive ability for us as artists to be reached out to because of your unique style and everything else. But the other side of it, and um, you know, from our last panel in Dallas, I guess that's two panels. Denver. No, Denver was the last. I'm going, I'm going, yeah, I'm going to to okay. to Barton Damer. Gotcha. And and one of the ways that he really blew up is he reached out to the places that he was really interested in. So they got to know him through actually direct sales. So that's one of the things that we, you know, as introverts, if you're like introverted, that can be a challenge, but we can do it digitally now. So one of the things that we have to do, especially if you're not at a studio that has all the work, is to start getting yourself into position of where the money is flowing. So like when NFTs were a thing, a lot of people, you know, sat back and avoided getting in and then it became too late. And there was a whole lot of money that went into it. You might've not worked on an NFT project or you might've, and you, you might've gotten paid something or the, you know, it was a, you know, build and bust. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was burned. trying to he NFT project. He might've got burned on an NFT project. That's a thing. But if you take a look at industries, you can see, just look at the charts of where money is going. There's hundreds of millions of dollars going into AI. They'll need creative to be able to tell their story and especially how do they differentiate themselves. So that's something just to think about uh, in creative, how to support the growing industries. So we really think the companies that create AI art are going to be looking for artists to create the art? <laughs> So it's well, for, so uh, if you took a look at their hands, they'll probably need a little bit of cleanup, <laughs> at least now, right? So the, the idea is, yes, AR, AI art is coming and it's fast and it's here, but there's still storytelling that needs to be done and mm -hmm. there's still cleanup. So I think right now- if, Chat GPT does not make a, an enticing story. So there's, I mean, and that's the thing is there's different, there's different <laughs> roles that AI is playing that are amazing for other people. I think for a lot of people who are visual, um, we love it doing all the writing for us. Like we don't want to sit back and write long letters mm -hmm. and we don't have to want to write all these professional letters often as artists. My bio you, was written entirely by Chad. G. Yeah. So you might not want that. And then for our, you know, for writers, they often want to be able to get something visual instead of having to shop around and hire a lot of, you know, different artists that they might not have budget for to get a concept. So it's filling these gaps but it's not perfect. So looking at that last 20% and 
and coming in as someone who can enhance whatever is created gives gives you a, a cutting edge versus somebody who's not who doesn't know how to work with it. So, so it's it's something that yeah, there's the threat is real, but right now the ability to work with it is great. And if you connect with people and show that you can work with the technology and enhance it, you're going to be way more valuable than the person who really isn't. Definitely want to piggyback off of Matthias and the, uh, the story part, even though AI is great. I love my AI or Velard, to be honest. Um, it doesn't have the ability to do what an illustrator or a writer can in that it can make a succinct story visually or like auditorily, right? Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. You got the worst it's ever going to look. And next month yes. is the worst it's ever going to look then too. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah, but I do it I, um, consistently, right? And I think I think that's the awesome part of still being an artist, even with the pro generation of AI. You still have the ability to add that twenty percent, whether it is to dial down the story, dial it into whatever it needs to be, or whether you need to use it as like just a tool, because that's what it is at the end of the day. Um, you have a style; you can iterate that style really quickly, find that composition. Ha do whatever you need to and work it out. Yeah, it's great. Here's what I'm going to say. And I, I, for those listening online, I know I said this last week, but I feel like everyone needs to hear this, is that uh, the people who are going to jump on the AI bandwagon and not use motion designers anymore, we're just looking for an excuse to never actually use a motion designer in the first place. You know, it's the same type of people who pirate software they were never going to buy that software in the first place so there's no reason to market to them you know it, it nike's not going to start doing all their commercials using chat gpt and ai art they're going to reach out to some of the best in the industry who they trust in order to create their vision for them you know it's the people who are going to jump on this bandwagon and be like sweet i never have to use this again that we're never going to use you in the first place. I so just, good. I Get just, rid of that. I just finished up a job with Nike and they, <laughs> and they brought it to me and it was 99% done, all done by AI and they couldn't fine tune it just enough. And that's where I had to come in. So I, I had to rebuild the whole thing. And, uh, but I looked at it. I'm like, next year you won't be, you won't be reaching out to me because the AI will be able to get the very specific thing that you needed that it couldn't do right now. But, yeah, something... Yeah, but that doesn't mean that, doesn't mean that Nike's only going to use AI, right? There are different levels at Nike. You know, you're going to have some of the lower-end people using some of this stuff so that they can get some good, you know... I'm, I'm trying. Matt won't let me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Every time I got it. Uh, Matt's in the of you. Here we go. Well, it's something I want everybody to really keep in mind, and it, this is rapidly changing all the time, is everybody keeps on saying, well, it can't do this. Stop saying that because it's going to be able to do that thing soon. I mean, I feel like in Dallas, somebody was saying like, well, we need people to write the prompts. Well, it's like the newest version of Midjourney, you just type in a basic prompt and it will autofill the rest of it for you. That is now if that, it's like, oh, we need to we need prompt writers. It's like, yeah, we needed them for three months. <laughs> so every time anybody's like, oh, like you like you, they'll never replace this part of it. It'll never replace that part of it. It goes to we're talking about the ambient needs across the board. Yeah, you're stop saying, saying that you're gonna let them know where the jobs are yeah. being taken from. Well, but it's like, okay, the final job right now, it needed, you know, it needed David to jump in and fix everything. But what about all those middle managers who was like, oh, they would have hired an artist. They would have hired concept artists to do a bunch of stuff. It's like, well, they skipped right over them. They couldn't cut David out, but they were able to cut out a bunch of the people that might have been in the middle of that process. And that's going to keep on happening. So the hope right now is that everybody gets to make more stuff where it's like, oh, before you used to make a still, but now you can make an animation before you used to make an animation. But maybe now you can make a giant interactive world that the hope is that more content needs to be created overall because if you think well i'll find this little niche and then i'll be safe there like no those niches are not going to exist in three months in six months definitely not in a year so well that's depressing <laughs> well no, that's what i'm saying it'll grow you you get to make more than you used to be able to make before i agree and you know it's it's like 
it's the same thing as like computing power, right? As soon as computing power is like, we moved over to GPU rendering, awesome, but we threw more at it, and now we still have 15 minute, you know, per frame render times and stuff. I mean, yes, it did, it did get a lot better, but maybe the, you know, you can just do more in the same amount of time. Well, I think one of the things that we're going to run into is we're we're running into a space where AI is starting to look really quite infinite in the possibilities and the multipliers. And the most valuable thing on the planet is not infinite, which would be human attention when it comes to markets, right? When it comes to people keeping their lights on and in an economy, it's where their attention is. So that's one of the things that I think we're at uh, a really interesting point in human history because everything that we're going to be doing is going to be interacting with this machine, right? It's a, this machine and this intelligence that at some point is going to change everything for humanity. It's not just artists, folks. By the way, it's not just artists. Since the beginning, since the dawn of creation, it's been humans and nature interacting. And now we have this intelligence that will be a thousand times greater than our parents on its worst day. Right On its worst day with glitches and errors, it's still going to be a mathematician. It's still going to be all these different things that you can ask it. And that's today. So the kids and the children, the next generation that's going to be born into this world are going to be interacting with it just like we interact with Siri, just like we're, you know, our cameras are on and it's listening to us. Well, it's going to have infinite data. But the thing that's really limited is human attention. We can only pay attention to as much as we're awake to within a certain time. So we only have, what, 16 hours of, you know. Until AI time. starts projecting advertisements in your sleep. Yeah, yeah. and they start using the brainwaves, which they can start reading brainwaves now, which is interesting. But that's, so that's one of the things to understand is the value of human attention is probably going to really start going up even, even further because there's so many things that are going to be able to fight for it. So it's just some interesting things of how can you actually have a greater impact as a human versus as an AI, where there's a story, how do you connect in a way that actually matters, that makes it more unique? And that's why meeting in person is a game changer mm -hmm. because you can, you can get a thousand things online, but it, it's not going to make you feel as good as it is as somebody who smiles at you that feels like you want to work with them. You want to spend your time doing that because guess what? AI could do it, but I just like actually calling Brilli and just, you know, spitballing ideas. And that feels better than Oh, here's an idea. It's already done and it already has an animation and it already has a story and it's already, you know, running ads. Oh, okay. I guess it's done then. It's like it just strips, it strips away the human elements. And we actually really like those as, as human beings. We love that interaction with other humans. So that's what I was saying about the prompts. And I was like, if art was writing prompts into a computer, I would have never gotten into art, to be <laughs> honest. Because there's that, you lose that connection between artists and the technology. And I think, I think that's the thing we have to think about. I always thought it's funny because like the writers are on strike now, you know, because they're fighting against open AI. And then the next thing I look on Twitter and it's like artists are actively using AI and looking like, how cool is this? And yeah. it's like, what? It's like we're in different worlds where we don't understand that we're working with the thing that's going to eventually take us over. And I think it is going to come down to a point where... We do have to do something. Do you like, like I see you stressing out over there. Oh, it's, it's, yeah, no, go, 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 go. <laughs> yeah, I don't have any answers here, but this is a, it's a very, it's, it's an interesting conversation, of course. I mean, like Matthias said, the, the Pandora's box is open. What are you going to do? It, it, it's, it's already happened. We're going to have to figure out how to work with it somehow. I, I don't know what the answer is to that. I mean, we, I was fascinated with Mid Journey when it came out last year. It was just Maybe it was around this time last year when I when I downloaded it or you know signed up for it, and I I generated my first image and I was like this is crazy you know and we we actually were trying to figure out how to use it at Mad Microbe, not to create the art for us, but to to help us explore ideas from which we would then create our own work, um, and not copying the work necessarily, but just you know. Um, you know, a lot of the work we do, it's sort of visualizing things that you would normally not see with your naked eye. We're, 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 we're uh, exploring uh, microscopic cells and, and molecules and stuff, and you're trying to make that stuff look interesting. So there's a, there's a level of uh, creativity that you can kind of apply to that. So we were using MidJourney to sort of like, all right, what would a neuron look like if it was, you know, 
had some kind of cool um, whatever. You know, I, I can't think of the prompt right now. But uh, <laughs> yeah, prompt writer. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, so we were you know we were going that route, and it was it was interesting. But but now you know, not even a year later, it's like you know things have uh, it's it's. There's, I think we're up to, to Mid Journey Five now, and it's. Um, you can see where it's going. You can see it's you know there's it, it is going to be an infinite level of 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 uh, expansion and um, uh, perfectionist perfection of the uh, the the imagery that it's able to create or whatever it is able to create. So I I'm at a loss right now to to even know where things are going. I think we just have to sort of just just sit around and, and sort of watch, watch what happens. You know, it's like, uh, there's, yeah, I'm, I'm at a loss right now. I'm, I, I'm excited to see where medical goes with this, you know, because I know a lot of doctors, uh, are very excited about the prospect of AI because, you know, there's so much involved. We, we had, I can't remember his name. We had someone on the show who's a medical illustrator, um, and he was talking about how the FDA approval process goes and, you know, it, it, you, you, you figure out something and then you create a pill or something and then they've got to do tests on animals and that fails. And then they do a different version and it's like, okay, then we, they test that. But what AI is able to do is figure out, you know, so many of those skips steps to that they can skip in order to get you further along uh, through either molecular folding or whatever it is, you know? And so I think there's going to be a big boom in the medical industry, which may help medical illustration because they'll need to show that off a lot. But I am excited about at least in that form factor, how it's happened, uh, what's going to go on with that. Yeah, and for for me in in that world, like of of AI, there's one thing that I feel that we've seen it in a lot of places that we love, and it's kind of terrifying because we like spending our time creating and seeing how quickly things get created. I think what will really change everything is when we really start seeing AI in the financial world for the individual, right? So when individuals are running investment strategies like the the big boys and coming up with you know really good rates of return, so now okay, money seems to be somewhat consistent because I find that the only argument against AI is they took our jobs, right? It's like, it's literally that. It's because there's a financial component that we need to survive that we're in a situation that if that is, if that feels threatened, it feels really terrifying versus, oh, how can I create more with this? And how can I create things that are really meaningful? Because I think the meaningless work or the the work that people are just churn and burn, that's going to go away. Like, I feel that, oh, you're just hiring someone to just run an ad or whatever. No, forget that. Like, I'm just going to say, hey, run some ads and do A-B testing and do a thousand iterations so you find the highest converting one and do videos versions of it. It'll already know all those different things to do. And some of them are already in place and they're getting built now. So, like, the, that work is going to go away like the the simple like create an ad like create this campaign that's going to go away it needs to be something more and i feel that's where the human element you have to start looking at what is uniquely you as well as your network and how you're connected and who you're connected with and what can you do that's that seems you know human and valuable to you go get him chris yep well to piggy to uh, piggyback off of that like a lot of our worry and the anxiety is all the short term stuff it's like how is it affecting me right now or in the immediate future but the good part of this is like it's it's just a good thing for there to be more intelligence in the world and if it's machine assisted intelligence this can only like keep raising everybody up like if we aim for that good future that good version like getting new medicines and new technologies and solving problems that we we couldn't have like humanity was stuck like on like you know you know caveman era for a really long time and once you start getting more humans together and more thoughts and more complex ideas and the complexity can build on complexity which can build on top of that this is unlocking every individual person's ability to do more than you ever could have could before and us as a collective along with ai are going to be able to do so much more on top of that plus art's fun i like art i like doing it for fun 
you know, even if AI creates the best art in the world, I'm still going to do art for fun. You know, they can take my job. I don't care. <laughs> you know, I'll go do something else, but I'll still create art. Meal plan. Meal plan. There you go. <laughs> I think it would also be really interesting to see how the next generation will receive this. Um, kind of what you were saying earlier, Matthias. Um, you know, my mom can't tell when things are photoshopped and like, we, you know, I believe everything I see on TikTok. And mm -hmm. so the next generation will be probably much better at digesting all this stuff and they will be much more literate. So maybe that's where this like human focus comes in, where they would be like yearning for more human. After getting bombarded with all this technological information, they might yearn for that human connection. You mentioned Photoshop and and I, when I was in college, Photoshop One came out as well as the first Mac. And I just, we were having these same kind of conversations then. Like we thought, you know, what are we going to art school for? This is all going to be done on a computer. It's all, all going to be Photoshop, uh, you know. I know that's very a very simplistic way to sort of compare the two things. But I think, like I was saying, there's, there's things we don't know. There's things that we, we can't see. Things will evolve. And I think... I think you're right uh, where, you, you know, I, I, think, I think humans do need to create something. You know, I think art is something, it's part of, the, uh, part of humanity. And I hope that we will find ways to sort of work around or work with the changes that are coming. Um, I don't know what they will be, but I think we, it's just impossible to know yet. But I think something, something's got to evolve or change with it to allow us to keep doing what we're doing yeah i, I, yeah. I mean the big concern that i have is in the world of of finance right because that that's because that's what guides everything right the the jobs that we get it's all you know it's all monetary so that's a really interesting thing and like i feel that the automation process of a lot of these tools can bypass things and i feel that you know ai is is a tool that is much more generalized than any one specific tool like a Photoshop or like the calculator, because especially now with things like Agent GPT, you can just give it a general task and it will start working on it. And um, when you can do that a thousand times over, it gets really interesting. But I really like what you know Chris was saying is how do we gear this more towards the golden age, the Star Trek, where we have food replicators and we you know are building things on atomic. Got to find some dilithium crystals, dude. I figured <laughs> this out. Good old dilithium. Ago. Yeah, that's it. Um, so there, there is like this, this beautiful world where it's like, okay, you can be creating like whatever you want and you can spend more time on the creation because these, these tasks that would be like drudge work, like, oh, I got these clients that I don't want to work with that might be four years of my life to learn these skills that can just get replaced really quick as AI gets there. Maybe you're just spending four years really working on something that very much matters, you know, that is part of your creative legacy that's unique to you. So I think it, like all of humanity, we have this, we're at this crux where things are going to get really interesting really quick, but AI is a superpower. Like it's, you know, like nuclear weapons, AI, it's, I see it on, on par, like the things that you're able to do that are not even, you know, that we don't even see yet. Like the campaigns that you can do when you have AI versus people that don't have AI, it's, it's phenomenal. Like you can, you can send messaging out that's unique to someone that's tracking everything about them and all the things that, you know, trigger their happiness, all their emotional reads that we as an artist couldn't do. Like you couldn't track a thousand people and look at what does each one look at on a day-to-day -day basis and what do they like on a day, like that data is tremendous and that's what it's going to be using to create. So we're going to awesome. be in a really, really weird <laughs> world. I mean, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be weird, but the idea is how do we actually gear it towards the golden age? Mm -hmm. And I feel that that's what we, it's our job to gear it that way. So what are some positives now that we are about to end this podcast on a really downer <laughs> now, what can we, what can we look forward to? Well, the question was, uh, oh, it's, not, it's not so much, is it a downer? It's just that that's the thought because of finances. So think about when we get finances right with AI and it's doing, it's saving you 40% on your taxes. What, what, when you're found a six different ways for you to generate income, like now you're like, oh, okay, great. I can spend more time with my family. I can do these other things. You think about every CEO everywhere. They're looking how can I automate and how can I be more efficient? What if your AI was doing all that for you? 
And that's, that's, that's what I would see as the positive. It's finding ways to maximize your life and you, what's important to you. Patrick, you got something to say? I know you do. You're going to cheer us all up right now. No, I was just going to say, I feel like there's something to be said for not always having to be like the most optimized, fast, AI driven, I guess, if that's what we're talking about, thing. Like to me, I feel like following the rabbit hole where if we keep going exponentially, AI, everything gets even more optimized, everything's faster. We're just going to end up in like Wally, where everyone's just like in this spaceship, not doing anything, just like has their AI bot next to them. Like I feel like there's something beautiful about being like human and creating having like the the long parts of the project like not everything being so streamlined and faster even though i guess from a financial standpoint and like a ceo they they want that like i've always like liked the parts of the project that's like all right this part's a little bit slow this part's a little bit faster so i think i feel like just as humans like you were saying like there is something human about just creating art in the first place and why we all got into this and i think as this stuff keeps getting oversaturated, the stuff that's handmade is going to be maybe even more in demand and sought after in the future. I agree. I don't know. I agree. Pendulum's going to swing. Just like everyone wants the artisanal everything now, you mm-hmm. know, back when the 80s, everything was future. Now we're going back to, you know, handmade stuff. Some of the 80s is back. I've seen a lot of mullets lately. <laughs> so I'm working on mine. Um, but I think, yeah, with AI, I think there's going to be good and bad. I think it's going to empower. I think we have to, it, it's always, do you look at things half glass full, half empty? I think this is like, I, I, for my presentation, I was like, I'm a terrible modeler. And that's really a barrier for me to like execute on my ideas. And so if, and I think that's where it's going to be is like the artists who have the ideas, who have the vision, when those technological barriers come down, that is very freeing. Yeah. Like, that's why I use Cinema 4D because I opened Maya once and I immediately closed it because I'm like, I don't know what the hell's going on. And I mean, that kept me from learning 3D and kept me from making and enjoying making all the things that I do today. So when you have the Move AI that I was showing, it was like, I'd love to do character-driven stories, but I just can't rig a character for the life of me. Mm-hmm. Well, there you go. That barrier is down. You can tell your story now. And so yeah. that's where I think if we want to end on a positive note, that's where AI can be uh, very empowering for an artist and actually put you uh, in uh, connect more with with art in general because you can actually do it. Awesome. I, I would say one thing to add. Oh, more oh, positive. It's about to come down. No, no, no. More, more positive. No, no, no. Then that's more positive. That's more positive. Is I do believe that the human will become the premium experience. Right now, I, I, was, I say it's a premium because right now when I call premium any company experience. and I'm not talking to a human being, there's often I'm like, I would spend 10, 20, 30, 40 dollars if I could just talk to someone to work it out versus me going through this prompting system, me going through anything like just to talk to someone and then start working on it from a human perspective because that's an issue. Yeah, they might get it worked out in the next five years, but right now I think human, like human experiences are going to be the premium. I want to talk to someone. I don't want to talk to the robot. I, I agree. I, I think that's going to be the premium. So yeah, that's positive. Yeah. And on that note, I'd like to take a moment to thank all of y'all for coming out to this wonderful event. It's the third one of many, and hopefully it'll keep going on until the AI overlords take us all over. <laughs> so on that note, thanks for joining us. You can check out our podcast, mograph.com slash podcast. And uh, yeah. I would have been Dave. <laughs> no, EJ. Oh, would I would have been Dave. <laughs> we could both be Dave. He would have been Dave. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm that. And this is that. <laughs> and this <laughs> was. Oh. Oh. All right. You need to get up. And y'all are Dave. And this was that. Thank you so much. <laughs>